All right. Story of the day, how to win the battle within. An elderly Cherokee was speaking to his teenage grandson about life. There's a fight between two wolves taking place inside of me, he said. One wolf stands for fear, anger, and resentment. The other wolf stands for joy, peace, and love. He looked directly into his grandson's eyes and said, the same fight is going on inside of you too. The teenager thought for a while and asked, grandfather, which wolf will win? The wise elder replied, the wolf that you feed. You become what you think about most of the time. There is so many books that back up this claim. Obviously, this is just a, a fun story from Dr. Gilbert's book, but <clears throat> this is the entire premise to Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. This is a decent amount of the backing for Carol Dweck's mindset, and most business leaders that you speak with will often say the same thing. We become products of our subconscious. If you don't believe that, uh, ask yourself if you are in fact the sum of your five closest friends. For you guys, it may be a little bit offset in college, but you'll notice also there's another adage that backs that up as well. Birds of a feather flock together. So all of those things are saying the same thing. We're drawing these connections and connecting dots. <clears throat> Basically, if you want to be a little bit more intelligent and carry yourself a little bit more proper, hang out with people that you consider proper and intelligent. It doesn't mean these people are intelligent, these people aren't intelligent, but it's your definition of proper and intelligent. If you are hanging around with gang members and bikers and everything else, you're going to tend to act like gang members and bikers. If you are uh, financially well off, you typically have financially well off friends. Um, and it just goes on and on. There's, there's some research that shows that if the father is active of a child, the child is X amount to be more active. If the mother is active and the father is inactive, then the child is a little bit more likely to be more active than if the father was active. If both parents are active, it's not multiplied, but it is significantly more than each of those. So even if the mother was more than the father, so in order, it's mother, it's a father, mother, and both in terms of likeliness, and both is way more than the father and a little bit more than just the mother the sum of its parts, right? The greater than the sum of its parts is basically what we're getting at. All of this ties into what we focus about subconsciously. So keep your thoughts positive and you'll keep your actions positive. All right. So we consider squatting a pushing movement. Why are we pushing? We're pushing against gravity. We're pushing our feet into the floor. We want to talk about active daily living variations of squatting, involving variations of squatting. Using the bathroom is one of them. Sitting down on the toilet is one of them. Sitting down into a chair, getting off of a chair, getting into your car, getting out of your car, unless you're driving some kind of lifted truck or Jeep or something like that. But getting down into your car, getting out of your car, sitting down currently right now in front of the computer, you got there via a squat. So it is, in fact, an active daily living. Also, it strengthens up the same joints and muscles and works the balance of the same proprioceptor uh, sensory neurons that walking up a flight of stairs does. So if we wanted to draw connections and make very vague hypothesis, we could say that the elderly probably need a barbell squat because it would help their strength and balance of joints and proprioception that are involved in walking up a flight of stairs. So we can make a lot of arguments with why everyone should squat, and we use this by uh, we create this by using logic and scientific backing. Introduction. The squat is one of the most important and complete strength training movements and mimics many acts of daily living. The squat strengthens the hip extensor muscles, the knee extensor muscle, as well as supporting muscles such as the spinal erectors, abdominal muscles, traps, obliques, latissimus dorsi. Joint actions and prime movers. This is one of the more important parts of this entire lecture, and we're going to build off of it more and more and more throughout the semester. Hip extension and prime movers. We have the gluteus maximus and the hamstrings, biceps femoris, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and adductor magnus. We must know these by the individual muscles, not just the groups. Knee extension, prime movers, quads, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, vastus medialis, rectus femoris. That's a pretty easy one. Lateral means outside, medial means inside, midline. So lateral, medial, and then you have one in the middle. So outside, middle, inside. Vastus medialis, lateralis, intermedius. Then the rectus femoris. So that one's a little more difficult to remember because the hamstrings is the biceps femoris. But as long as we know that uh, rectus is on the front and the biceps is on the back, we're good to go with that. Next. 
next slide. Joint actions and prime movers for the back and trunk is an isometric contraction and stabilization. Prime movers are erector spinae group, latissimus dorsi, trapezius, obliques, and abdominals. Also, we're gonna add the hamstrings in there because again, they help stabilize the hips. Squats are a full body exercise. We're gonna talk about executing the back squat. This is A way, not B way. This is the way that we are tested. This is based off of the NSCA, which is the textbook material for this class. This is to create a baseline in the industry. One of the issues, in my opinion, of our industry is the very low entry, low standard of entry. But once you're in, you can create your own methodology. So we need a high bar of entry, which I consider the NSCA. And then from there, we can build upon our own training principles and methodology physiology, uh, philosophy, sorry. Start with the bar empty at first. I don't care if it's a five, 600 pound squatter or a brand new squatter, maybe not brand new because they may not be squatting with a bar on their back. But we start with an empty bar for two reasons. One, uh, post-activation potentiation. And two, to ensure that there are no um, existing overwhelming injuries or soreness. So start with the bar empty, get warmed up specifically throughout your range of motion, grip the bar outside of shoulder width, pull yourself under the bar. By pulling yourself under the bar, you're putting the bar in proper place, getting your, elbow, getting your elbows in and your traps engaged, your last engaged. Pull yourself under the bar and lift your elbows, track the bar. The bar should be placed just under the spine of the scapula, the bone at the top of the shoulders. Blades is gonna be a little bit relative if you're doing high bar or regular. Take three to four steps backwards and feet should be turned out zero to 30 degrees, anywhere in that range, zero being pointed directly forward. Where's my camera? There we go. And then 30 degrees out any more and you're putting un unnecessary uh, rotational forces on the knee. Sit back and descend to proper depth or as far as possible with a neutral spine. This is a key, key term here. What we see sometimes is people going a little bit too low for their current ability or mobility and their pelvis will actually shift under and some people call it a butt wing, some people call it a pelvis tuck, whatever you want to call it. What happens is the lordactic arch in the lower back starts to round out and the hips tuck under. You want to avoid that motion while squatting. One thing that we can do to prevent it is uh, bring a rib cage in and squeeze our abs tight before we start to descend instead of arching hard like as if we were deadlifting and then go down to the go down to the proper depth of before that happens so stop before it happens essentially would be an easier way to word that stop before that tuck happens drive your hips straight up in the air that doesn't mean rotate like a pendulum it just means the chest and hips rise together Walk the bar all the way back into the rack until you hear the metallic click and then lower into the hooks themselves. And again, we reemphasize this is not the way, it's a way. Breathing during the squat, we're gonna use the Valsalva maneuver. There's been a lot of issues with this in the past. Uh, being able to define this, the Valsalva maneuver essentially creates a fluid ball inside the thoracic cavity. It does, it, uh, it does that by the increased pressure of the breath that we take in, closing the glottis, and forcefully trying to exhale. That forceful exhalation against a closed glottis puts all of the fluid in the visceral area, the visceral organ area, into effect and creates a giant fluid ball. Or another way to look at it is like an airbag for your spine. So if we take in that big breath and then brace as if we're trying to expand out like a, like a blowfish, 360, we're gonna feel pressure all around our visceral organs. Not, not painful, but we're gonna feel that pressure in a 360, not just pushing the stomach out. That's another flaw in that. And if we're wearing a belt, it's gonna help us even more create significant pressure. This airbag for your spine or fluid ball inside your thoracic cavity will keep your back from flexing. <clears throat> the slide, obviously hold your breath against closed glottis while pressure is applied by the abdominal and thoracic muscles. Increase lung, intrathoracic pressure, increase intra-abdominal pressure, spinal rectors contracting, creates a fluid ball. Uh, I left a note in myself to add a citation. It's in the textbook. Um, under breathing. 
increases pressure and stability, but also in very rare cases could cause cerebrovascular accidents due to increased pressure of the arteries and cerebrospinal fluid. It can also cause vasovagal syncope. I don't want you to read this as don't use the Vesava maneuver because it's dangerous. I want you to read that this as you should use the Vesava maneuver when using heavy weights. However, there are certain risks involved. Okay, so there was those are two main issues. One, it's a forced exhalation against the closed glottis, creating a fluid ball. Two, it does have some risks involved. This is just a, a diagram depiction of the valsalva maneuver and what's happening. So we have the closed glottis, pressure here, pressure here, um, saving the pressure here, abdominal contraction pushing out, fluid pressure from the visceral organs creates one big bowl. Back squat cues, some that work pretty well, butt back. So we wanna break at the hips, knees out and back, but we wanna break at the knee first. So we are letting our knees track forward some so we can keep the weight over the midfoot, knees back and out. Superhero chest or skydiver chest, or in my case, leading with your chest. Rip toes, master cue. Think about keeping the bar over the middle of your foot. That is his most popular um, cue. And it's pretty good because it adds relativity in it. So it's keep the bar over the middle of your foot. So if your knees have to go further forward because you have long femurs or if you have gigantic feet that changes the placement, whatever it is, uh, it, it adds relativity to it. Tight back, drive your hips straight up and out of the bottom, taking your chest with you, obviously. Don't just drive your hips up and keep your chest there because then you're going to good morning the weight up. And that's one of the common problems with a powerlifting squat. Coaching Q disclaimer. disclaimer. I didn't put the flex seal guy here. It was a hilarious slide. I'm disappointed in myself. Anyway. Coaching cues disclaimer, coaching cues are not a cure-all band-aid, nor do they work effectively if the coach does not know the athlete well. So if we don't know what the athlete's um, language is, I guess, or a way to communicate well with them, then we're going to have issues getting our what we're asking them to do apart. But the more profound of an understanding that you have and the better of a communicator you are, the quicker you can break that barrier, even if there is some kind of um, issue in understanding what it is physiologically that you want from them. Back squat, spreading the floor versus drive your heels out is just one example. I was told to spread my spread the floor for years and conceptually I understood it, but it still didn't do much for me as drive my heels out. So now when my feet are separated and I'm at that zero to 30 degree rotation, if I try to push my heels out or spread the floor, then I get better coaching cue. I, I find myself mentally more engaged with doing what I'm supposed to do with that coaching cue versus spread the floor. If someone is really struggling with that, um, you can have them stand on two small items, whether it's a paper plate or two small notebooks, and have them actually push them apart and they'll help them understand a little bit. Another example is a sumo deadlift, push the knees out versus get your groin as close to the bar as possible. Those both accomplish the same thing, but one tells you what you're trying to accomplish and one just tells you what to do. So spread your knees out or try to get your groins close to the bar. Accomplish the same thing in the end result, but it, one may make sense more than the other to specific um, lifters. You must know the lift and the lifter very well in order to make effective coaching cues, be a great communicator and a profound understanding. Back squat checklist. So the checklist is what uh, more, more of what you'd get tested on versus the back squat checklist because back squats are extre uh, cues are extremely Relative, so the checklist is a little bit more of a hard objective list of what we want to look for. We want a neutral spine. What a neutral spine, we talked about a little bit early in class. Uh, if some of you were not on this, okay. So neutral spine means from the, from the head down. So a chin tucked is not necessarily neutral. Chin up is not necessarily neutral. Rounded upper back, rounded lower back are not all not neutral. So the spine naturally has the lower dastic arch, then the thoracic uh, curve a little bit, and then another curvature in the neck. We want to maintain that best we can. Knee, hip, and back angle. We're looking for, um, oh man, if I had the dry erase board in person. I didn't, didn't think about doing this with pictures. 
right, let's get to a clean page here. So kind of what we're looking for, kind of what we're looking for on a squat versus a deadlift. Here being the deadlift, the torso is much more bent over. So we have feet, knees, hips. Here being the squat, ankles, knees, hips. That's the head. I didn't give this guy a head. But either way, it's uh, what we want to make sure we understand is that different uh, different lever links for different sized athletes are going to have a play with what we are doing. So we're looking at this from a biomechanical standpoint. If a lifter has very long femurs, then they're going to have a greater knee angle and higher hips in the deadlift. And if you go into any post of someone deadlifting on Instagram or Facebook, you're going to see comments almost always telling them, hey, make sure you get your hips down or making some other arbitrary coaching cue that may not necessarily be applicable because they are not familiar with that sized lifter. If you look at someone like Eddie Cohen, there couldn't be a better person built for deadlifting. And Ed Cohen also has several world records, right? So it's, he's using his, uh, his natural ability for that. Whereas someone who is significantly longer and leaner are not gonna have a great deadlift because they're gonna have a super narrow stance and a very high hip angle because of the uh, long femurs. Um, knees out and tracking over toes. We wanna make sure that we are opening up the knees, stretching the adductors a little bit, getting it down to full depth but our knees are going forward a little bit and in line with our toes. So in line with our toes means they're not collapsing or pushing out, which is valgus or varus, valgus being in, varus being out. Appropriate depth for the individual, I always suggest staying inside of your pain-free range of motion, no matter your age or your ability. If you're getting down to a certain depth and it's causing pain, there is something wrong. That's the, the end of that, to stay in your pain-free range of motion. Feet should be flat and weight should be on your heels or towards your midfoot. We use heels because we want to get them sitting back. A lot of people are very shy of getting their hips back and their knees go too far forward uh, and they're not stretching their hamstring or using their glutes as much in that scenario. So weight flat and, uh, sorry, feet flat and weights tracking over the backs of the feet to midfoot. The importance of bar position dictates the body position. Why? Um, you're going to have your chest much higher on an Olympic squat than a uh, powerlifting squat and the highest on a front squat. So we can see the change in knee angles and the change in hip angles by positioning. So this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, kind of with the limb links of deadlifters. This guy, uh, shorter guys such as Ed Cohen may deadlift from a position like this, or not shorter, but it's based off of your tibia and femur link. So his hips could be a little bit higher and he's good to go. And now his shoulders are back behind the bar and he has, he is biomechanically advantageous to deadlift. Whereas a longer limbed lifter would have their hips up here and a greater knee angle. So now more pressure is felt in the back because they're not in a sense behind the bar and able to drive their legs. But in terms of squatting and bar positioning, the, the lower the bar is, the more glute, hamstring and back work we're gonna get. The higher the bar is, the more quad, um, the more quad usage we're going to get, as well as the greater range of motion. You can see how low the butts are from here to here to here. Also, of course, in that is uh, ankle range of motion as well. A lot of people will say, oh, I can't front squat or Olympic squat because I have poor ankle mobility and blah, 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 blah. But the ankle does play into effect, and it's probably a little bit uh, more underrated than it should be, but specifically the knees and the hips give it away the most, and they're – the ankle is gonna mirror the knee and the hip. You're not gonna get super low angles of rotation with the knee and the hip and the ankle stay the same because all three joints work together in a squat and deadlift. The importance of bar position is the change in moment arm. 
the perpendicular force and the axis to the line of actual force. So if we're looking at a crowbar, it's probably the easiest analogy for this. If I were to take a crowbar and try to open a window that's jammed, which one is going to be easier to do that with, a long crowbar or a short crowbar? A short one? Mm, a long one in this case because it's going oh, yeah. to increase our moment arm of, of uh, effort. So there's Got always it. two moment arms, moment arm of effort, moment arm of resistance. The longer the moment arm of resistance is, the harder things are. So that's the short crowbar because the moment arm, the force on the opposite side of the effort is longer. So a long moment arm always benefits the, effort, the side it's on. If it's on the side of effort, it benefits the side of effort. If it's on the side of resistance, it benefits the side of resistance. Got it. Always, okay. no problem. Yeah, always avoid unwanted moment arms. So if we, prime example is deadlifting, what is gonna be easier if the bar is closer to the body or further away from the body? Easier on the back. Closer. Closer. So you're closing the moment arm of resistance and you're increasing the moment arm of effort because you're reducing the distance between the working muscles, the backs and the glutes, and the resistance, the weight on the floor. So you're reducing the amount of resistance arm on the back. It's not super important for this class. It's very important for biomechanics and it's important to understand as a coach just ways to make the lift a little bit easier because at the end of the day anyone who's doing resistance training's goal is to get stronger whether it's gain more muscle uh put up more numbers whatever it is typically we're lifting weights because we want to get stronger or we know we need to because we need to get stronger so understanding the ways to get more pounds on the bar and get the muscle stronger and more efficient then we need to find out little ways to kind of hack those exercises. So always looking for um, mechanical short fan, uh, shortcomings. And if you're a fan of strongman, like I am, then you'll understand that it's simply a game of smoke and mirrors. It is all physics. And the better you are at understanding physics, the more, the more uh, points you can put on the board. The class of lever that your hip is, um, depending on if you're squatting. So here would be the moment arm of resistance because the weight is here. Here would be the moment arm of effort. So it would give us the hips being the, the hips and knees to fulcrum. Yeah, think about that. Uh, either way, most levers in the body are, I believe, second class. We're gonna have to, gonna have to follow up with that. They're the least advantageous. That's the way it were designed. Most joints are similar. Uh, and making us the most mechanically disadvantageous because our insertion points of our tendons are very high. But if it were the other way around, we would look very weird. So if our bicep, our bicep inserts right here past the elbow because it controls the elbow. So if our bicep was instead attached here, it was attached here, we'd have this weird bat-like skin flap here, but we would be able to curl a lot of weight. So most joints are made that way for human movement, not so much lifting weights, because we could get significantly stronger if we could push that tendon down the limb a little bit. The importance of bar position is the compression, tension, and shear. So tension is the same as, uh, is the same as, uh, same as traction, excuse me, geez. Um, so we have compressive force is we are, our torso is directly perpendicular to the ground. The bar is resting on our back. That's compressive force. Then an example would be um, shear force. We went from a high bar where our torso is completely perpendicular like a front squat and we rolled the bar down to a low bar and now the bar is sitting caught mid torso like this. So the, this is the bar and this is my torso. Now the bar is a little bit lower. Now the bar is pressing in in down towards my uh, torso as opposed to directly down. So we go from compressive force to shear force, if that makes sense. These being my vertebrae, compressive, shear. So the, uh, the amount of force that is, <clears throat> of course, is, is the um, force times uh, mass times acceleration or work is the amount that's affecting that. But 
Um, some people that, that do low bar squatting will have pains in the upper back, not necessarily stemming from or, or kind of hard to figure out where they're stemming from. It could be the amount of sheer torque they're putting on their upper back, but we also know that compressive forces are bad. That is why um, a lot of people will use a machine called a reverse hyper that we'll talk about significantly throughout the semester if you're not familiar with that term. You can look it up. Reverse hyper, it, reverse hyper extension is a West Side barbell design. Lou Simmons um, broke his back in in powerlifting, and then designed a piece of equipment that would apply traction and encourage blood flow. Used it for I don't know how long, and then came back and set two to six more world records after the fact. Pretty impressive. Worked for him. It's anecdotal. It's not uh, not proven by anything. Everything is individualized and relative. This talks about the torque of the quadriceps a little bit and the hamstring muscles with running and sprinting, any, any knee flex and extension exercises. All right, more high bar versus low bar. High bar is more vertical back angle, more closed knee angle, more stress. So more closed knee angle would be less degree of rotation or uh, less degree of flexion. I'm sorry, extension, less degree of extension, geez. More stress on the quadriceps, more compressive force on the spine. Low bar, greater muscle activation. It does incorporate larger muscle groups, hamstring, glutes, and it also does put more stress on the adductor magnus. So it can be tit for tat argument wise uh, without EMG and backing it up. We just know that it is different and it does put the emphasis on different places of the body. And it also has more shear force on the spine and less compressive force on the spine. All right, so this is a, this is a picture of uh, which is being more worked so we can see in a more upright position like this this picture here the hamstrings are working a little bit less because the arrows are smaller the quads are working a lot more the arrows are larger here this balance out between quads and hamstrings you'll notice that power lifters uh, typically have very ginormously uh, ginormous and ginormously defined hamstrings it's because they do a lot of um, hip back hamstring loaded exercises such as low bar squatting, sumo deadlifting, things of that nature. Spotting the squat, what not to do, be this guy. <clears throat> He's got a spot on the right side that is, that is doing a lot of work. He's got a spot on the left side, on our left or our right, doing nothing, and a guy in the back doing absolutely nothing. So, squatting the spot is unfortunately quite intimate, especially if you and the lifter are around the same ability. Uh, you, Typically what we do for same sex is go arms under armpits and cross over, not necessarily making contact, but prepare to make contact, support the chest and come up. Um, this is, that's the, the preferred method of being spotted. And that's my preferred method of spotting. If you have opposite sex, it would be the same position, but instead of cross over, it would be more under the arm and maybe on the bar. If you're of equal, if you're close to equal strength, if you're spotting someone that's a lot stronger than you, you're gonna go ahead and recruit two other spotters for side spotter. So they went about this method correctly. They have a spot on the left, spot on the right, spot on the back. The spotter in the back is always the one making the, sh calling the shots. They're the ones that say, grab it, don't grab it, or we'll support a little bit if needed. If they just need that final little bit to get up. And you'll have different coaches having different arguments on whether they should grind through it with just the one spotter or if as soon as you know they're not gonna get it, take the weight off and finish the exercise with your two spotters on the side. It's semantics. One thing is for sure, if you, you should be greater, you should be of equal to or greater strength than the person you're spotting. If you're not, you should require, you should recruit two other spotters making a total of three. Stand behind the lifter and lift up on the bar in order to take some of the weight off the reps that can be completed by the lifter. I don't like supporting the bar because I work with strong people and if they're doing a strong squat and I just grab the bar and try to lift up like this, I know good and darn well I can't front delt raise much weight at all. So if my training partner is going for a 650-pound squat, it's going to be real cute for me to attempt to do that, and we're both going to end up injured. So I go under the armpits, cross the chest. I'm intimate. Three, two, one, we're down. I squat down with him, come up with him without touching him until I know he needs it. A little bit of application versus uh, book right there. So make sure that we're, make sure you're prepared to defend your statement. We'll put it that way. Back squat progression, regression. TRX band assisted. 
uh, box squat, bodyweight box squat. So TRX or band assisted, you can use TRX straps or the ring, whatever you call it. It's basically straps hanging from a higher point on the ceiling. You use that to help support your weight up. Uh, you can use a band as well. Bodyweight box squat, you want to use a box that's easier to teach on a box than it is uh, free squat. Then we go to bodyweight box squat, a little bit easier to teach again. Bodyweight squat, PVC squat, throw that, uh, throw a PVC pipe or a bar on the back and let them fill it out. Empty bar squat, loaded bar squat, etc. Don't worry about the review or the homework. The rest of the squads are from the other, the rest, sorry, the rest of the slides are from the other textbook on our syllabus. And it is just pictures of the muscle, the anatomical muscle and its capability, where it inserts, where it originates, the bones that it uh, spans upon, and what it's capable of doing. These are all hand home picking pictures. So sorry for the uh, background things. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. All right. So we will worry about this a little bit. In our assignments, by Monday of next week, we're going to have each of us upload a video file. You can use a YouTube link. It's preferable that you use a YouTube link uh, of you performing and explaining the squat, explaining biomechanically, and which is, means joint actions and prime movers, and explain coaching cues, common flaws. Um, this will be turned in on Monday. I'll create the assignment and have an area for you to upload it. This is basically how your practical is going to run out. So consider it practice for your practical. That is the last slide. Do I have any questions? Uh, just for the lab. So when demonstrating the squat, like 